Thank you, um, Adrian. Um, first time for me in Toronto, actually. Um, I come from Finland, so I know the snow, right? Um, first time actually in Canada for me, ever. I think I've been about in 75 countries in the world, but uh, so far I hadn't uh, managed to, to be in Canada yet. So great to be here. Um, thank you. And uh, actually first time in, um, in energy and mining conference. I've, I've spoken um, probably between 50 and 20 conferences around the, um, a year, every year. So, but somehow I missed uh, this one. So far, I've learned a lot. I, I can tell you already that about how much fuel is consumed and, and you know, cooling of the mines, which I had no idea before. Um, so, uh, very uh, excited to learn all that. And I have to say that, you know, one of the conferences which uh, um, shocked me, I guess, uh, positively, is that you have a ping pong table outside and you have ice cream. So if I can say, please invite me also for the next year to, to um, speak here, hopefully. And tell about a little bit more what we do. Um, I know that the four o'clock, uh, at least in the power generations or renewable conferences, people start to drift away and a little bit uh, towards the, the lobby and you know, a few drinks uh, maybe here. So um, if you're interested in, in these things, um, on, on here on stage of, of prices of gold or copper, you can head that way. I'm not going to talk about this at all. I'm going to be touching on the lithium and cobalt stuff, um, which relates to the batteries. Uh, so you might want to stick around. Um, crude oil, gas. Um, yeah, I'm, I think I touched that a little bit. Um, and how I'm going to do it, uh, I'm going to actually talk about efficiency. How you can actually improve the efficiency of your existing or new generations. I, I'm assuming a lot of times that engines, reciprocated engines, it might be turbines also. So I'll touch that. A big topic of course here has been the um, CO2 emissions. Here's a chart um, which I pulled out from Bloomberg. It says uh, scientific based targets, SBT. That's a good thing because south from here there's another types of truths also in the market, but this aims into uh, how, how do you reduce the global warming by 2% by 2050. So I'll touch about the emissions uh, also here. And lastly, um, I'm gonna touch also uh, the grid uh, stability, resiliency. How do you actually do that uh, with the modern technologies? And I'm actually gonna touch about this too, which is hopefully preventing the blackouts that you might end up with. If, if you don't manage your energy systems correctly. So the question is, okay, what I'm, I'm promising quite a bit here, so um, what is it that I'm, I'm proposing? I think you all seen uh, this graph. Where is the solar, or actually it applies also the wind? What is the levelized cost of electricity prices? If I gone further down in history, you could have seen even more dramatic drop. But today, the solar prices I think are pretty much matching already the levelized cost of electricity by any generation. So it's cheaper to build solar or wind than any other type of generation. Typically they're of course consuming uh, fuel, which adds a lot to the cost. So what about the, I think we heard this, so what about if you combine here either the brand new Varsila modular block uh, engine power plant or maybe existing power plant with the solar uh, power. So what are the benefits? I think we've heard that a few times already. The levelized cost of electricity, uh, you'll probably reach uh, lower levels there. And obviously you will also improve uh, the emissions or reduce the emissions of, of that generation. I think there is also buts here. What happens when you have combine these two? If you combine engines and wind, Probably you're gonna increase the spinning reserve requirements of that engine power plant. And you might actually, uh, because of the volatility of the solar output, depending of course where you are, you're probably gonna also decrease the system uh, stability. If you look at the existing generation then, um, obvious one is okay, I'm gonna run less engines. But depending on, on what kind of uh, 
solar profile you actually have. If you have a lot of cloud events, maybe you're actually running more engines because you need to have more spin in your reserve. I think the typical measurement or how do you size it that you could lose 80% of that um, energy production from solar plant in one minute. So you would need to prepare for that drop in solar electricity. Then of course the maintenance, are you getting the maintenance uh, costs down because you would run less engines? What about load chip capabilities of those gensets or then the minimum load requirements which somebody mentioned already today? So, could the end result be here that actually you start to curtail that free solar energy? What's the other option maybe? Energy storage. Here's a Bloomberg data, um, I think that published about a month ago or two. For 20 megawatts, 20 megawatt hour uh, battery system, full EPC price. Energy storage is a little bit complex. You have megawatts and then you have megawatt hours. I'm not sure you're a lot of aware of that, but uh, this is dollars per kilowatt hours prices. And the next year, the Bloomberg data is saying that, you know, maybe we'll reach as all in cost $434 per kilowatt hour for full one hour energy storage system. As you can see below, batteries are roughly the half, and then you have inverters, other uh, EPC costs, and, and also maybe a small margin for system integrator, as we hope to call ourselves. So this is obvious too, right? So you combine the gensets and the battery storage, what are the benefits? Of course you get optimized engine operation, yes, probably lower uh, LCOE also. You get lower emissions because you run less engines. And you probably get a little bit better grid stability also at the same time. So let's take an example. How does this work? I'm not sure I haven't found any uh, buts on this one. I think I found only yeses here. If you have an existing power plant which has uh, six engines, N plus one, so you're actually operating them in this, uh, this is calculated yearly averages, but the load point would be 62%. Average efficiency of that plant, these engines would be 41.7. They would run, not almost uh, a whole year round, but you know, 7,300 hours, depending on the load profile. Transient load capaci capacity, G2, um, I'm a mechanical engineer, don't ask me what that means, but uh, I hear it's uh, decent. But what happens if you add energy storage to this existing uh, capacity? So you would have this setup. So you have six engines, actually increase the load point, um, average load to 78%. Average annual efficiency would actually increase 1% point. Obviously, uh, savings through the fuel because you're running on higher efficiency. Engine running hours, you run less engines but on higher load. The, the overall running hours are 5,840 uh, hours. G3, that, the better thing. And obviously, the better uh, emissions. Less emissions, you run less engines, right? We have done quite a few calculations. So this, this all depends where you put, what is the fuel price, what is the variable operational maintenance cost. Yeah, you can get down to the two and three years. So I'm a little bit puzzled why, why the market hasn't picked up yet. Maybe it's around the corner next year on this one. And I know I'm gonna a little bit shoot myself in the foot with this next one, because actually if you're investing in a new power plant, what if you don't install that one extra engine and actually save that uh, for the storage? Uh, and, and through that, I'm, I'm sure that you know, a few years uh, starts to sound pretty reasonable for a simple payback time. I know we produce the engines at 107 LG. Engines too, but I think you, you figure this one out pretty soon uh, yourself, if, if not already. What's the third obvious one, right? The triple hybrid. So the combination of the engines or turbines existing on you, solar and, and storage. I walk you through this um, as a little bit of actual uh, business case on island grid, island grid. And what do we have here on this example? They have 14 megawatts of engines. They have renewables. In this case, it's uh, 12 megawatts of wind. And they have decided to invest uh, energy storage, 6 megawatts, 6 megawatt hours, and balance of plant equipment on that. 
And here comes the beef of the whole thing. So you need to have some sort of energy management system that is actually able to optimize all these different assets that you have and produce maybe even have some external data coming in through the weather forecasting. In this case, they are using wind forecasting. One is from the, the forecast and that is actually measurement on the turbines. So how much you're going to get production from those wind turbines. So what do you get out of this? If you play the whole thing, you orchestrate the whole thing uh, smartly, you're probably going to maximize the renewable integration, maximize that free energy if you wish. Hybridization, optimization of the, any assets, including the, the gensets and the energy storage. You're going to optimize the spin in your server and have the power quality and grid forming capability also, meaning the black start capability, if you do this market. So what we have, we acquired, Varxil acquired a company called Greensmith about two and a half years ago, and, and this is why we acquired the company, because of the capabilities and in-house uh, energy management system, which well, it's a bit of a funny joke, but it gems as the, one of the pressures. Um, so what's in that orange box, which is the beef? So let me try to, a little bit, um, I, I asked our software guys what's in here and I thought it's going to be super mystical and something that, you know, I don't understand it at all. It was partly that, but I think it boiled down to three things. One is the forecasting, which is super important. Yeah, okay, obvious. You will forecast the wind, you forecast the solar how much you're going to get. We heard already a few examples here how they forecast the, the solar part. Uh, however, you also forecast the load. Yeah, it might be, might be something that, okay, it's obvious, but actually forecasting it. Yes, you're probably getting the signal how much you need, but that's for that moment. But we are forecasting in this example, which is real, uh, 15 minutes interval. So every 15 minutes we forecast everything again and again and again. What do we do next? When you have that input data as good as you can, then you start to do rolling dispatch. So this is how do you reach the lowest cost of electricity the production. So we do that every five minutes in our energy management system. So every five minutes we calculate yet again um, how is, is the next hours gonna be optimized for the lowest cost of electricity. And the last thing, of course, it's nice to keep the lights on also, so we do real-time controls. This happens in the milliseconds level, hundreds of milliseconds level, so actually keeping the, the lights on and the frequency at 50 or, or 60 hertz, wherever your um, system might be. So that's what's happening. I think even I can understand that. Um, I'm, I'm sure you get a grasp of it. But then it goes way deeper when you start to talk to the software guys. How is this actually done? And how is this all the optimized? It's basically math. Um, optimize anything is about math, right? And that's what we uh, pride ourselves on. This is a real case from that same island. So just an example. Um, there is a 50 megawatt load uh, demand, roughly. You have some energy storage at the beginning. You have some wind turbines producing, pretty stable. And then you have an engine plant. If you look at the time scale here, it's in seconds. So every tick there is a five seconds. Then there is an incident. Um, it, it cannot be Varxila engine because it trips. Uh, but maybe somebody else's uh, engine. So what happens here? Frequency drops immediately in milliseconds. In this case, it reaches 49.85. It's not too bad yet. I think you're still keeping your uh, grid stable without dropping some load. And what happens with the energy storage? This is what happens. So this place, they have uh, uh, three inverters, all about two megawatts. Um, so everything kicks in, uh, in about a second. And you can see that how the re uh, frequency is restored. So this is what the energy storage can do and how it can help, um, for example, here on, on restoring the frequency very close to 50 hertz. This is not my slide. I stole it from, uh, from this customer who has this system from us. And there's always interesting thing as an as a OEM, you always learn something from the customer, surprisingly. Sometimes you're not willing to listen, but you know, we, we learn. And I looked at this graph when it was shown with my, uh, by my good colleague 
from Contact Global. Um, it says before gems, before that smart part, and then after the gems, uh, year to date. And I looked at the first green part, which says 3% capex reduction, and I'm like, huh? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, you invest and that's it. But if you read it, what it says, with the spelling mistake from their side, uh, increased lifetime of assets. Yeah. Actually, they're going to run less engines. They're going to last longer. They need to also maintain them less, which is the next point. But I never thought that, ah, actually, yeah, you can. The lifetime of the plant is increased. And that's how they calculate the capex reductions on that. OFM uh, reduction 10% by reduced manning hours, as I explained earlier, and optimal engine running regime. Fuel reduction by 10%. Two parts of that, 6% increased renewables uh, through the wind, uh, higher wind penetration, which they earlier needed to spill. And then also 4% uh, points on uh, efficiency improvement from the engines because they high, uh, run on a higher load point. Yeah, um, cool. So is this a mine? Um, no, actually it's an island. Um, it's in the uh, Caribbean and it's uh, part of the uh, uh, Dutch Antilles, uh, one of the ABC islands, Arriba, uh, Bonaire, and uh, Curaçao. Uh, and this is what we're running with the gems. So I don't think it matters if you're a physical island or if you're island grid or, or micro grid. I think it's all the same. The question is that how you, you're running it. How far are we willing to push this? This is another example. Are we getting that island? Sorry mentioned 33% of the energy is going to be produced by renewable on that island, the Bonaire Island. How far are we pushing it? We we're talking about 100% renewables, um, also in my um, title for this presentation. This is another real case, smaller load, 1.5 megawatts only seems to be there. Have a look what's on the screen. This is actual data from the island. You have solar, which is in the morning trying to pick up. Something happens, probably clouds. It doesn't pick up, uh, seven goes actually down at seven. You have wind, and the green is batteries. This is actual data, and this is actually 100% renewables on that island. I just spoke with the CEO uh, of this developer, and they said that the, they have reached three days without any generation from their engine power plant. Three continuous days on 100% renewables. I think that's pretty uh, remarkable, and I think that's uh, where we're heading with the renewables storage, and yes, probably with some thermal um, call them backup uh, generation. You heard already from Dennis this morning. Uh, we are very proud uh, to be a part of the B2 Goals uh, project in Fecula Mine, uh, adding in uh, solar into the plant, uh, but also now. We're adding batteries, um, your 70 megawatts, uh, 50 megawatt hour battery storage uh, with the gems and uh, also forecasting for the solar plant. So very proud of uh, being part of that project and actually capturing a lot of the value proposition I went through uh, in this presentation. So with that, that ends my presentation. I haven't touched too much on the Vaxilla module walk. We have wonderful guys here at our booth. They will be delighted to tell you all about the our solution of that. I'm happy to take any questions on energy storage and particularly the energy management system. Thank you.